Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. You go. No, that's fine. That's totally fine. Yeah, so I'm going to start it again here. So, so tonight's presentation is uh, being given by David Schmetterling. And David and his wife, Marilyn Marler, are members of the Native Plant Society, and they are in Missoula. And for more than 20 years, they have taught folks how to use Montana native plants to attract wildlife in yards and gardens. And David works for the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. He's been there for at least 25 years. And currently he's serving as the fisheries research coordinator. David and Marilyn also have a blog. It's called uh, the Montana Wildlife Gardener. And he stopped maintaining it in 2019, but it's up on the web. It has a lot of really good information and I'll go ahead and put the address for the blog into the chat as well. Um, so during the presentation, I'm gonna ask everybody to turn off their video just to help save on bandwidth. And we will have time afterwards for questions. So type them into the chat and I'll read from that um, at the end and Dave can um, answer any questions that you might have. And then if you could keep your microphones muted, that helps too. Um, so with that, I think, um, yeah, we'll just get on and I'll hand it over to you, David. Um, so thanks very much for coming to talk with us here. Yeah, thanks, Andrea and Karen for the invitation to come and talk to the Kelsey chapter. The last time um, I talked to the Kelsey chapter, I did it in person um, at the library. And that was, um, that was probably, I don't even know, 10 or 10 years ago, 15 years ago or something like that. Um, yeah, th thanks a lot. It looks like there's a, a lot of people here and I it's, it's neat to be able to recognize a lot of names, not just from the Kelsey chapter, but some folks around the state. So thanks everyone for attending. Um, what and you know what I'm going to talk about tonight is gardening with Montana native plants to attract Montana's native wildlife. And more than anything else that I talk about tonight, um, you know any of the details or, or things, I just want people to to come away knowing that it, it's it should be fun, relatively easy, gratifying, and it is ultimately beneficial to wildlife. And you can make a difference in your own backyard. I'm going to share my screen with you, and if um, and please, if it if it doesn't uh, show up, I hope somebody will will tell me. Um, and like Andrea said, um, I do have I, or I did have a blog for a long time, and a lot of that and 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 a lot of the time I, I was updating it was pre-social media. Um, and uh, and that was you know real good way to communicate and, and get information. Stop maintaining it probably well before 2019, but that's when I really pulled the plug on it. Um, but it's up there as a resource, and I hope people have the opportunity to to check it out. Everything I cover tonight is going to be found um, in that blog, um, in in some way or another. But since this is a native plant society um, group, I know that uh, you all care about plants a lot and, and you're, many of you are, are avid gardeners. I feel like I should, I should warn you um, that the, the following presentation contains herbivory. So I, I want people to be prepared for that. And it might not be suitable for all audiences. So viewer discretion is advised. So I use the term a lot, conservation gardening. Um, and you might hear terms like, you know, wildlife gardening um, and other things, but I want to put the focus on the fact that you can, what you do in your yard matters, that you're not disconnected from the, um, you know, from the, from the ecosystem, you're not disconnected from wild places, even if you don't live in very wild places. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, what is, you know, what's the context for a home garden and why use natives? Um, I think I'm going to be, I, I don't think this is going to be a tough sell to this crowd, um, but, but nevertheless, I mean, even though I think everyone here recognized the importance of native plants, people don't always recognize the importance of native plants um, in the garden. I'm going to be focusing on wildlife gardening, uh, talk about habitat, um, and, uh, and that's created by using native plants. And I'll end with some plant recommendations as well, um, mainly because that's a, that's a question I get a lot of time. 
And I'd be really remiss if I didn't mention this, and this is another reason for using native plants. Um, you know, climate change is real. It's because of us. It's bad. Scientists agree on this. But th and this is where my talk comes in. We can do something about it, and you can make a difference with simply how you um, landscape your yard and maintain your yard. And this, I think, is the exciting part of all this. Um, you know, the first few bullets here, every you know, people are really aware of, but it's very easy to get discouraged and think that you can't make a difference, but you certainly can. Um, you know, Andrea, you know, mentioned my blog, and I talked about it earlier. Um, it, it's a great resource, I think, for everything I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, you'll see a lot of the same images um, that are on here as well. And everything I'm going to talk about tonight, um, I'm going to use examples from my own garden in Missoula. And the reason for this is I want people to recognize that you know, I just live on a small city lot um, right in the middle of Missoula. And um, my wife and I have, have, um, have been landscaping our yard for, you know, well, actually for about 20, 20 or so years now. We've done it slowly and we haven't, um, and we've just done it ourselves. And it's something I think that should be really approachable. So to get at the idea of what I'm talking about, when I say I live in the middle of town, here's my house. You know, we own about 0 0.09 acres, um, just like everybody else over here, uh, painless steel tattoo and body piercing. I think they have a slightly larger lot than we do. Um, but yeah, we li literally live right in the middle of Missoula. We don't live adjacent to um, natural areas or public lands um, or next to the river or anything like that. We just live you know, smack dab in the middle um, of Missoula. So everybody's yard, everyone's garden is different. Um, but I think you know, one helpful thing, um, I, I think for folks that are considering using native plants or attracting wildlife or you know, wanna think about their yard in a different way is to describe what your goals are. Everyone is gonna have different goals. And just as an example, this is something that you know, we, Marilyn and I, you know, literally sat down and talked about. What are the goals for our garden? And a lot of these things are, I think, what, what most people share. Well, to some degree. Um, we wanted to use just Missoula area native plants in our landscape. And that's kind of, you know, people might think of that as somewhat limiting, um, that we're just restricting ourselves, you know, to plants that are native to the Missoula area. But what you'll see is it's really not. And there's a lot of opportunity for diversity being so restrictive. The reason we didn't want to use, you know, Montana native plants is because that is, you um, um, you know, it's an arbitrary, you know, a bit more arbitrary of a designation and what's native, you know, in southeast Montana, um, certainly, you know, may not be appropriate for what, what, what might grow in northwest Montana. We have a tremendous diversity in this state of, of landscapes, habitats, and also plants. So we wanted to try to grow just stuff that was native right to the Missoula area. We only wanted to water what we eat just our vegetable garden. That's the only thing that once established, we plan to irrigate. So as you see pictures of our garden, you know, keep that in mind. We have a very lush, I think, beautiful garden. And the only thing that gets irrigation is our, is our vegetables. We wanted to create wildlife habitat, even in the you know, center of town. That was one of our primary goals. Um, we also live in a small, um, a small house. So, you know, our yard is an extension of our living space. And as you'll see, we've landscaped it to include areas for different activities, whether it's, you know, dining or cooking, entertaining and other things. And then this is a little different than, than many people's goals, but one of our goals is also to educate others and provide a demonstration of what can be done, you know, in a yard right in the middle of town using plants that are just native to Missoula. So being right in the middle of the town, a lot of the wildlife that I'll be talking about um, um, inviting and, and, and fostering are insects, right? Since we live right in the middle of town, we don't get many deer and they're actually welcome visitors to our yard. And I'm sure a lot of people are, are might be getting a little nervous with that statement, um, but, uh, but we do get deer. Um, it, it, they are kind of rare and it is very exciting. 
Um, we don't, you know, get get bears um, in our house. Although the trampoline bear, for those that remember, wasn't was only a few blocks away. Um, you know, one of our goals was simply just to have a lot more flowers. When we moved into our house, there was just a lawn and a dog run in the backyard that was filled with about waist high knapweed. Um, we wanted to just be able to look out our back door and see a lot of flowers. We also want an area for vegetable gardening. That's really important to us. We have a vegetable garden, a greenhouse, um, you know, and, and as you'll see other elements of the, of the yard. Um, also chickens, um, a chicken coop, uh, and, a, and, a, and a place for a small chihuahua to go as well. We wanted to accommodate, you know, other of our, you know, hobbies and activities, you know, off when we're not out camping, we needed a place to store our camper in our garden as well, and we accommodated that. So we're not just creating, you know, habitat for wildlife, which we are, but we're creating habitat for ourselves, um, and the two can be intertwined. Um, one thing to consider is we just didn't want to have a garden that was um, you know, going to be beautiful and lush in the fall and only interesting then. We wanted it to be interesting and reflective of all the seasons we have. One of my favorite times in our garden is when things start to dry out as they naturally do around Montana in the summer and start to cure. And that's a, that's a time where our yard feels very much connected to um, you know, to the hills around the Missoula Valley that we see. You know, it's not the emerald green lawns, um, but it's the similar, similar color palettes and textures that are out there. And even in the wintertime, when you know, we don't have any flowering plants per se, um, the garden and all of its structure um, provides a lot of interest. So it's, you know, it's, it's not just about the showy blooms in June. There's always something going on and there's always habitat. Um, in our yard. The last element that, that I mentioned was about education. And this is not something that, you know, I think everybody wants in there um, as part of their garden. Um, but, you know, for example, our front yard um, and the boulevard are very public spaces. In fact, you know, our boulevard is, is owned by the city um, and we just, we just landscape it. So we took this as an opportunity to provide interpretive signs, um, and a demonstration of kind of a wild Missoula prairie there, whereas other parts of the backyard, you know, are landscaped a little differently, but all with native plants. And obviously one of the reasons we, um, we enjoy having, uh, you know, some interpretive signs in the front yard is, is to let people know that this is indeed intentional, especially certain times of the year. Um, so putting this all in context, you know, I think that there's this notion that your home garden is somehow separate from the wild. And time and time again, what we find is that's really not the case. You know, um, introduced plants or many of our noxious weeds are escaped ornamentals. They're plants that people brought to their garden and thought that they would just stay within the confines of the garden. Um, and whether it's, you know, invasive plants or animals, you know, many of these are escapees. Um, so I would say most people's you know, yards, as I'll talk about, they look like their neighbor's yards. And I think a lot of people, unfortunately, view that as all that is possible. So what I'm saying here is your yard can be more than just a collection of ornamental plants, and it can provide and accommodate for wildlife, even right in the center of town. And some of this wildlife you can attract you know, some of it is, 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 is or, you know, some of the common things, um, but others are more unique. Um, this is a viceroy, <laughs> a butterfly, you know, a monarch mimic, um, you know, in, in our garden. Um, monarchs, you know, I think that they, you know, oftentimes give, uh, give wildlife gardening, um, uh, or people, you know, unrealistic expectations, especially in Western Montana or, or um, yeah, especially in Western Montana. In Central Montana, you know, it, it is in the flyway. And I think, you know, inviting monarchs can be really successful in Missoula and, and other areas of, of Western Montana. It's just not really, uh, you know, appropriate places for them. And I think people set that goal, unfortunately, um, you know, and, and, and feel like it's, you know, that, that's the only species of butterfly you can attract. But indeed, we do get monarchs in our garden. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, just about every every year we get some, but it's more of a, um, 
more of a novelty than it is like a, a goal. Um, so homes across the landscape, if you want to think about this way, think about it this way, are an ecosystem, whether we like it, what, whether we like it or not. Um, they occupy a large connected amount of land, right? And, um, you know, in the past, they've really been influenced by these notions of what a garden should be and what it should look like based on, you know, our European examples, you know, when, which were from a different climate and had a lot different maintenance than I think most people are willing to do. I mean, I think for the most part, people, when people talk about um, gardening or landscaping, they use the term working in their yard or working in their garden. And it has become to many, you know, this, this, this task of maintaining something that they don't particularly enjoy. And this is where I think there's a potential, you know, that, that with all this development and homes and cities and towns and all that, um, there is a potential there that people can make a choice of how they want their yards to be and what they want in that landscaping. So there's definitely a potential for conservation of our unique flora and the fauna that really um, rely on it. So, you know, this isn't just um, when I talked about, you know, how landscaping has been conducted in this country historically, um, you know, rep representing other countries and climates, you know, we see this, you know, homogeneity across the country. If you go to Maryland or you go to Utah, you see the same few species of repeated, or that are repeated, you know, Kentucky bluegrass, um, arborvitae, and probably some other ones. And, um, and you lose that regional distinctiveness of what, of, of what plants and, and the landscapes are. And unfortunately, that's you know, really why a lot of people move to areas you know, like Montana or, or anywhere is because of those you know, beautiful, unique uh, uh, landscapes and plant communities. It defines you know, who we are and where we are. This isn't just an aesthetic problem, it's actually an ecological problem. Because as we convert these areas to just ornamental plants, we're removing the ability of so many um, animals, insects, for example, and birds ultimately to use them. So I hope that this, what I'm saying, it isn't depressing, but rather I think it's, it, it's hopefully empowering. It's saying that, you know, homeowners are, could be a very big part of conservation and what you do in your yard makes a difference. And it could be part of a solution um, to what we're seeing globally right now, um, and, and certainly locally with the, you know, I'm, I'm sure people have heard about declines in insects, declines in birds, declines in biodiversity and all these things, and it's very easy to get up, upset, but you can be part of the, the solution. And that's with native plants. So why use native plants? Um, you know, it, like I mentioned, it gives you a sense of place. They're suitable for the environment, right? They're drought tolerant. They're wherever they are, wherever native plants are, whether they're in, um, you know, the northeast of the U.S. that receives, you know, 40 or 60 inches of rain annually. That's what they're used to. Whether they're, you know, in, um, you know, Montana that receives, you know, in, in, in a place that receives, you know, less than 12 inches. That's what they're used to, and that's what they're they're adapted for. Gardening with native plants is less resource intensive and it's not just water, it's everything that goes along with, with, with landscaping and gardening. You know, native plants don't need soil amendments. They don't need fertilizer. Um, they don't need protection from the cold or the, or the heat because the, these are the habitats. I mean, by planting a plant in the right place, um, you know, is, uh, um, is their preferred habitat. Um, they're never invasive. Um, just by, 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 you know, by their name, they, they can never be an invasive plant. They can never be um, a problem in that regard. And there is a na native plant for every situation that people describe. And sometimes they're very easy kind of one-to-one -one alternatives. You know, instead of planting, um, you know, an arborvitae, you could plant a Rocky Mountain juniper or, or something to that effect. But what I'm really going to focus on is for wildlife. And then for wildlife, if that's one of your goals, if you want to have more birds, more butterflies, more bees, more ants, whatever it may be, um, then you have to use native plants. And there's no way to get, get around that. 
And like I said, you know, the, you know, our goals and our wildlife are a lot of time insects, but the insects and the diversity is incredible that you can attract. You know, even if you look at your neighborhood as just a Kentucky bluegrass, um, Norway maple and arborvitae, you know, ecological desert. Um, you know, this is, you know, another, I, I, I love, I'm really fascinated by all the mimicry that goes on in the wild. You know, what uh, you look at at first glance isn't actually true. This is actually a bumblebee native that is, a, in fact, a beetle. Um, so some, some, some steps for a successful wildlife garden, it's plant native plants. So that's it. That's my talk. And i uh, be happy to take questions at this point. Okay, there, there's a few more things and I will, uh, I'll continue on. A diversity of plants. Um, if, uh, you know, if you, if you learn, you know, if, if, you know, if you remember nothing more, you know, from this talk, it should be, you know, you can have fun and use diversity of plants. Um, less lawn is another um, really essential step. Just, just reducing your lawn, as I'll talk about, can make one of the most beneficial changes for wildlife. Um, providing structure, and then providing those common elements you hear about everywhere uh, when, you, when you start talking about um, um, gardening for wildlife, food, water, shelter, places to raise young. And the way you do that is, is by doing, providing these things, a diversity of native plants, reducing the amount of lawn you have, and um, providing structure. So one of, um, you know, in the early, in the mid 2000s, whatever, my blog got um, popular, yeah, 2009-ish, because I offered ways of um, answering the very common question online that people were, um, were searching for is, how do you remove a lawn? And for a long time, it was between me and the LA Times that were battling it out for the top, top web search. Um, you know, 12 years ago. Um, but this is, um, you know, interesting that it's, it, it, it's such a common search term and brings um, so many people or it did bring so many people to my, my blog. Um, you don't have to get rid of all of your lawn, although I, um, I would certainly support that. Um, but just reducing your lawn in some way is probably one of the most, you know, sustainable things that you can do and the most beneficial things you can do to promote insect diversity. Um, by reducing it in any capacity and replacing it, I mean, even, I mean, frankly, even if you didn't replace it with anything, even if you um, removed a portion of your lawn and, um, and put down bark mulch or gravel or, or nothing, it would provide um, enormous benefits to insects, because one of the things it does is it, it allows that um, that soil um, and air and uh, and other connection that a, that a sod forming grass doesn't uh, sod forming grass doesn't provide. Um, yeah, so you'll provide habitat and food for a variety of wildlife. But I would recommend you if you do remove portions of your lawn to replace it with some native plants. So some lawn statistics, and these are a little bit outdated, but it's it's, and I think it's probably gone in the, um, you know, it, it's gotten worse than when I when I collected these statistics. Uh, this is kind of a sad one that the American lawn is now the number one irrigated crop in the entire United States. Um, that's that's more that we grow more lawn than corn or wheat or anything. Um, that is it. It uh, covers over 40 million acres, three times as much as corn. And um, this is a, a figure that I got for um, uh, for the uh, Inner Mountain region of the U.S. That people spend uh, in about two, 240 gallons of water per person per day to irrigate their lawns. Um, it's a lot, and you know, uh, a lot of that watering is done with um, water that's been treated, or it's been pumped, treated, delivered. <laughs> Uh, and it's suitable for um, for drinking, you know. It meets drinking water standards, and uh, and 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 so much of it, almost half of all of our municipal or more than half of our municipal water use goes into outdoor landscaping. Um, but then along with it comes the maintenance, and it's a, a lot of gas and a lot of pesticides and a lot of uh, and a lot of broadleaf herbicides that go into that as well. So 
you know, one question, you know, that, that people pose every so often is if you didn't have a lawn in your yard or could have less of it, well, what could you have? Um, and that's what we've, we've tried to do slowly over time in our yard. And what we have, like I mentioned, is um, this is a you know, picture from our backyard. Um, this is, you know, the only irrigated parts are, you know, the greenhouse, um, the greenhouse in here and the, uh, and the vegetable garden. Um, the rest, um, you know, probably hasn't been irrigated in over 10 years until those plants became, some of those plants became established. You can have a lot more. Um, a lot more areas to explore, a lot more areas to play, um, and, uh, um, and a lot more areas to observe wildlife and to, to use um, for yourselves. So native wildlife is tied intimately to native plants. I used the monarch example before because I think that's what most people, you know, that's when most people make the connection that, you know, monarch um, caterpillars only eat milkweed leaves, right? And we've got some species of milkweed in Montana, but like I said, Missoula is kind of outside of the flyway or a lot of Western Montana is outside of the, 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 the central or the Western flyways. We don't get a lot of monarchs here. Um, but for every, um, even though monarchs are, you know, aren't necessarily a, um, you know, a, a good goal, all of the other insects have those same relationships and those intricate and um, intimate relationships with a single species in many cases of native plants. So if you don't plant, if, if those native plants aren't available um, for, you know, um, insect larvae to eat, you won't get insects. Um, and um, yeah, so this, this is where we, we, we're going to get into some herbivory and things like that. So I just want to prepare folks. But um, so I call it native, you know, I, I use the term sometimes, you know, wildlife gardening, gardening or native plant gardening. And I think, you know, putting the focus on, you know, native plants or the end goal of wildlife, you know, is, is more of a holistic approach. A lot of times, you know, depending on uh, what's, what's, you know, what's popular for wild hummingbird gardens were really popular, pollinator gardens were really popular, bird gardens, all of these things, sustainable gardens, climate smart, drought tolerant, all those things, um, you can have all those things and you'll be successful if you just use native plants. And that's where I, I like to have the emphasis. If you want a pollinator garden, you have to use native plants because they will support a variety of life stages as I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, not just adult feeding. Um, so um, going back to our yard, um, you know, the plants that we plant in our yard, like I said, just using that relatively limited palette of just Missoula area natives, um, we have, you know, over 100 species of plants that are native to the Missoula area just in our, in our yard, 70 species, over 70 species in the front yard alone. Um, and we've done this by planting, what you say, like the right plant in the right place. Before, you know, our um, housing development was built between the 20s and 1940, um, you know, it was just a prairie, right? And, uh, or I shouldn't say just a prairie, it was a prairie. Um, and, you know, there probably weren't, um, you know, where our house was, there probably weren't aspen, there probably weren't Rocky Mountain iris, there probably weren't um, Canada violet, because they didn't have like the micro habitats that they do now. Those, all those plants are, you know, located on the fringes of the Missoula Valley, or even in some, you know, draws or areas that get a little more, more moisture. But you get a lot of, you um, micro habitats and, uh, you know, uh, and changes just by having, you know, homes on the landscape or uh, street trees on the landscape, it creates environments that are suitable for a wide variety of plants. You know, so it's not necessarily what we weren't going for, it was what it was like before our house was there, but what could be there, you know, if there weren't any other plants there. We do all this and we use less than a third um, you know, even with our vegetable garden, you know, everything we do with our yard, we use less than a third of the average um, Missoula home, a third of water, less than Missoula area homes. When I talk about diversity, um, this is this is what I, I mean, this is what diversity looks like. Several years ago, I, I um, 
I started, I tried to document, you know, one year of um, to what, you know, each day take a picture of a flower, what was flowering in our yard. And what you'll see here is uh, this is just, you know, one sort of snapshot of, um, you know, of hundred uh, of the hundred or so plants that we have um, flowering. You can just look at that and see that there's a lot, lot of different things. And this is why, you know, we have a tremendous amount of native bee diversity, for example. You're just using it, you know, just as, as, as one, um, <clears throat> one group of insects here, um, you know, the Hymenoptera, we have an incredible diversity um, of native bees. Um, and there's also just a couple of examples of introduced ones, you know, like, like the honeybee um, or the European paper wasp that give the rest of the native bees, um, you know, oftentimes a bad name. Bumblebees, we have so many species of bumblebees in Montana, um, some, and, and, and some of the most diversity of any place in the country. You know, in, in our garden in, in Missoula alone, we've had over 12 species of bumblebees um, use the garden. It's incredible what's out there. Um, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of, you know, we, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, colony collapse disorder, and this disappearance of honeybees. And that's taken the, the, the emphasis away of the diversity of all of our native bees and the, and, the, and the real problems they're facing, which are a conservation problem. Uh, whereas um, honeybees aren't a conservation problem, they are a, um, a short-term agricultural problem. Um, and it is just one species. So several years ago, I don't know how many people follow the provocative um, online blog Garden Rant. I wrote this uh, this article that that honeybees suck um, because they were um, you know stealing the thunder of many of our native native bees and uh, and the real conservation needs out there. When you talk about diversity, it's not just um, plant size, but it's you know blooming time and height, color, shape, all those things. This is a sagebrush buttercup, you know, one of the one of the first species of plants that flowers in our garden, um, you know, early in the spring in March, um, sometimes even earlier. And from that point until September or until October, we have new plants flowering um, all the time. It's a very long bloom period. And as I'll, I'll just scroll through a few different plants here, and you can really see that diversity um, in size of the flower, like these blue-eyed Marys. And if you think that there's a specific pollinator that uh, is attracted to each one of these plants, you can imagine the insect diversity um, that's needed or that, that, that benefits from these. The shape of the flowers like shooting stars or even the large you know, architecture of the uh, complex architecture of the um, showy milkweed, like I mentioned before, these all attract you know, really specific insects. Um, you know, the, the same thing um, that's going to pollinate one of one of the showy milkweed flowers isn't going to be attracted to that teeny blue eyed Mary or this nodding onion um, or the tubular shape of, um, of a bluebell or like a Rocky Mountain iris. So the diversity is incredible. And, and like I said, there's larval plants and adult insects that are attracted to each of these species. And you can never forget about our grasses as being flowering plants as well. And uh, they, they have a whole host of, um, of butterflies and moths that are you know, obligates of those species as well. And this is you know, what diversity can look like. This is our front yard. And this is, you can see where the um, um, interpretive signs are in the boulevard. It's very different than a conventional yard. And uh, you know, it's just, a, like I said, a wild Missoula prairie. But there are other elements of the backyard that are provided by native plants too, and that are common in the wild, but you don't see in people's yards. One of them are standing snags or fallen snags. I mean, this is what aspen do, for example. They're relatively short-lived. You know, each stem is relatively short-lived and they die, you know. Um, sometimes. And uh, this is the best habitat for a variety of different, um, different animals. Common in the wild, you know, just, you know, dead or fallen 
trees or standing um, dead trees or rocks or things like that, or things you see outside nature all the time, but you seldomly see in, in somebody's backyard. And bare ground, frankly, um, is, 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 is a habitat that often gets um, neglected. But this is where you know, so many of our, our native bees or bumblebees nest. This is a bumblebee burrow. <laughs> Um, you know, in our in our in our garden, um, you know, they're a colony nester, but they then they net, they burrow um, into the ground. They need that that connection to soil. Most of our native bees um, are ground nesters. Um, about twenty five or thirty percent, or something like that, of our of our native bees, maybe less than that, um, are cavity nesters. You know, what people talk of as like mason bees and things like that. But most of the time, they just nest in the ground, and you don't see them. They can't do this in a, in a lawn um, where there's a sod. They need to have um, some ground. But the plants provide so much more. So this is a woods rose and you can see these circular cutouts are made um, by another one of our cavity nesting bees, Megachylidae, the, um, I can't think of the common name right now for it, but they, uh, leaf cutter bee, yes, they cut <laughs> leaves and, uh, and that's what they're doing here. They're not actually eating it but they, they cut these uh, bits of leaves out and then form um, <clears throat> a little um, capsule for their eggs inside of a cavity. So native plants provide habitat in a lot of different ways. So again, diversity is, is really the, the way to promote native, um, you know, native wildlife and to attract native wildlife. What, and, and, one thing I think people are often attracted to is you hear these intimate relationships about, you know, like monarch and milkweed. And if I plant milkweed, I'll get monarchs. And if you don't get monarchs, that means, you know, you must be doing a bad job. And that's just not true at all. Um, and it's, it's difficult in a lot of times to just match one species to another species. And I, I get this question a lot that people will say, oh, I want to get, um, you know, checker spot butterflies, what should I plant? And, um, they do have a larval host plant, but it's that whole diversity that, that you need. And the reason why I don't like to suggest people match um, one species to another species is because there's really complicated interactions out there and you might miss those. So just to give you an example of um, you know, some of these complicated interactions and how cool you know, things are in your backyard if you just um, really stop and look. Just looking at this one corner where we planted a couple of aspen in our yard and just to see, just looking at that one corner over time, how many insects and birds use it and how they use it. So here was this little aspen grove we planted. Um, I, I don't know when, early 2000s and kind of thought, okay, well, that, that, that's great, that's all done. This is a shady spot in between our houses. Shade is a great surrogate for water. Um, like I said, we don't irrigate anything here. Um, Aspen, you know, they're native to the, the, the fringes of the Missoula Valley, but right in the middle of the Missoula Valley, um, they're not there. So there are aspens around and they're always under a bit of stress, just like I like to think of Missoulians to some degree. Um, you know, as soon as these aspens start to grow, they're really on the fringe or on the edge. Um, and, uh, you know, they make them susceptible to a lot of different um, diseases, funguses, um, and predators, um, which I'll talk about. So here's a story, and this is how it often happens. Um, in the springtime, this is a bald-faced hornet. They make their nests, and you know these these are you know giant volleyball, bigger nests they make up in trees. And most people don't even know that they're there until the fall when all the the leaves are gone or whatever. And then there's this gigantic um, hornet's nest in in their tree. They're not aggressive. The only time they're really aggressive is if you're trying to remove their nest, and you know I don't I don't blame them all that much for 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 getting mad, at, you know, when they're trying to destroy their house. But they they need um, <clears throat> they need wood, you know, plant material to you know chew up and and create that you know papery. Um, it looks like um, uh, yeah, it's just a big papery ball. If you haven't seen uh, a bald faced hornet's nest, um, and and where they'll go a lot of times is to aspen. I mean, aspen get eaten by everything. Um, and what they're doing, they're not actually eating it for food, but they're chewing it up and they're, and they're gonna make their home with it. Um, so they'll score the bark, they'll break through that outer layer. 
Um, the next thing that might come along, and I, you know, gosh, I should have warned people about this in the intro, but um, if there's younger children, maybe have them cover their eyes here. I didn't say this was going to happen. But these are aspen borer beetles, and um, I won't say what they're doing, but what this leads to is females laying eggs. And where the, the, the places that they'll use to lay those eggs are places that bald-faced hornets have broken through that bark, even though they have these big mandibles and they can do their fair share of chewing. Um, they like to, to start in an area that's already been kind of scraped away. Um, and you can you know, just get a sense of the size of this. My wife, Marilyn back here, she's about 5'4". So this thing is gigantic. No, this thing, they're pretty big though. And they're extremely well camouflaged. That's the amazing thing. I mean, if you look at um, you know, the colors and the, and, the, and the patterns on these, they are so well camouflaged for aspen bark, which is great because they are, um, they're slow and they're gigantic and they're horrible at flying too. Um, so this female is laying some eggs in the bark and then those, and, and, and she'll kind of seal it up with, a, with, with some saliva. As those eggs begin to hatch, um, well, I hate to say it, but this, this aspen now is probably dead because those borers are gonna kill that aspen in anywhere from six to 30 years, but that's a dead aspen standing right there. So what's going on here though, is the eggs are starting to hatch and the larvae are starting to bore into the aspen where they'll stay for a couple of years before maturing. But since there's movement and excitement that attracts these thatching ants that are gonna try to pull them out and, and eat them. These thatching ants are those ants that build those giant mounds. You can see them out on the prairie or out in, the, um, in, in Western Montana. Um, all over the place. And uh, they're really cool um, animals. Um, so the, you know, this excitement gets the attention again of the bald-faced hornets who will come back and try to eat those, those larvae as quickly as they can. Um, so at this point, you know, the, uh, the bald-faced hornets set this thing up, but now they're the aspen's friend, right? Because they're, they're, uh, they're eating those larvae. And this is what the aspen does in response. Um, it forces out sap to try to push those larvae out. Well, this sap is actually the best food for early season um, butterflies and other pollinators. They'll go to this because when the, you know, when it first warms up in the spring, you'll see sap flowing. You're not going to see flowers out, but it, it attracts a lot of our native butterflies that have overwintered as adults in hibernacula. So many of you have probably seen like morning cloaks, our state butterfly, the first day it warms up. And you wonder like, oh, how did that go from being like an egg to a caterpillar to a chrysalis and a butterfly in, you know, in, you know, in two weeks since the snow is gone? Well, they overwinter as adults in brush piles and things. And they go to this source um, of sap for food. So the borers, you know, after they, they penetrated through the skin, to the, to the skin of the aspen, they'll, they'll, they'll hide in there um, and grow and basically kill the tree for, several, you know, for anywhere from two to four years. Um, here's an area where I just kind of, I had, I had to see what one of these looked like in the tree. Um, so I, I pulled away some, some bark um, and to expose them. Most of the time they're not accessible to birds or any, anything else. And they grow large and big and they kill these aspens, right? Um, but when like hairy woodpeckers, for example, in this case, when they're nesting, um, this is also the time when these borer beetles start to emerge um, and, and move themselves closer to, um, to coming out uh, from behind the bark or you know, from deep in the, the cambium. And it makes themselves accessible to woodpeckers. Like this woodpecker is excavating this hole to get out some of those borer beetles. Um, it's a great source of food for their young. And it's timed, obviously, perfectly um, for that. But there's more. I mean, the duff that gets created at the base of the aspens um, from all those wood shavings and, and sawdust uh, provides, um, you know, uh, areas for, for, um, for overwintering or for pupation for a lot of different species, including some of these clear wing moths. This is another mim uh, um, bee mimic, but this is actually a moth. And, um, and they'll emerge um, from the ground right below the aspens from that duff that those borer beetles um, kick out. 
And not only that, um, other species of, like this is a, um, a, a white line sphinx moth caterpillar. And these um, will also um, you know, pupate in the, uh, in the ground in that duff. The neat thing here is um, their larval host plant is this one. This is a yellow evening primrose. And you can see the, uh, these are huge caterpillars. If you've seen one, they're like three to four inches long. Um, and you can see this, you know, despite their size, their camouflage is perfect for these leaves. Um, if you look at like the, you know, this is as, as a primrose leaf, and this is kind of the negative space or the black background. Um, so this has nothing to do with the aspen um, in terms of the host plant, um, but the aspen's providing habitat um, for this to complete its life cycle. So, um, you know, so, so just think about all these things happening, you know, one corner of your backyard, and it starts because, um, you know, an aspen is under stress and susceptible to border beetles. And, you know, if you Google aspen borer beetles, probably the thing you're going to find is how to kill them. And if you kill them, then you won't have any of these other insects or any of these birds um, to feed. So native plants are better for insects because native plants attract all the little different life stages, um, especially egg-laying females and larvae, um, because they have that intimate relationship. A lot of times you'll see like non-native plants being billed as great for um, um, butterflies or bees, but what that typically is, is it just promotes um, the adult feeding. And for most, in most cases, you know, adults will feed on anything, any kind of flower, um, but they won't lay their eggs on it um, and the young won't eat it. Um, you'll even see, you know, some species of plants touted for insect resistance but then also um, that they're great for insects, but you can't have it both ways. Um, a really simple way to put it is birds eat insects and insects eat plants. Um, and this is, the, this is the thing I was kind of warning about in the beginning, but um, if plant, you know, I've, I've seen this, this meme going around lately that, you know, if nothing is eating your plants, um, you're not providing food for anything or some, something to that effect, but that's, it's, it's the same concept. Uh, if you want to attract birds to your yard, they, they eat insects and what feeds insects are plants and the kind of plants they eat are the native plants. It, it's that simple. Now, I talked about the, the monarch example um, and that's one that I think everybody you know, grows up knowing about. Um, here's some of that herbivory. And you know, we do get, and, and I think in, you know, in, in, in Helena and even you know, a little east of there into central Montana, um, you, you can attract mo you know, monarchs with, um, with milkweed. Um, and it, it can be gratifying, but it's also not, there's other insects that eat, that eat milkweed as well. And there's a lot of really cool insects that, that you can find in your garden. This is a calligrapha beetle, for example, and it's obvious how it gets its name. Um, and it's just amazing what you can find when you have a diversity of plants. And so this was actually feeding on this, or on this uh, mountain hollyhock. Um, on goldenrod, you have goldenrod aphids. And uh, you know, I don't like to have aphids on my tomatoes or peppers or eggplants or whatever. Those are different species of aphids. And they're attacking you know, these ornamental plants in my, in my greenhouse. These aphids, you can see this, this, um, this Canada goldenrod here is doing great these aphids are not causing a problem. Um, and yet these aphids you know, provide so much food for so many different birds. Um, yeah, and or Oregon grape, for example, are, um, you know, support, uh, you know, a, a lot of, of insects like the, the shield beetles and early instars of these shield beetles here. So, you know, just kind of shifting into birds, that's, that's a common question I get. And a lot of people's goals are like, what, um, you know, we want to attract birds to the yard. What should we do? What kind of feeders should we, should we, should we use? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but we've had over 70 species of birds use our garden. And when I say use it, it's not like, um, like a bald eagle or great blue heron flying overhead or a turkey vulture or something like that circling around their neighborhood suspiciously. Um, 
it's birds that actually come in the garden, you know, land in the, uh, you know, on a tree, um, feed on, on insects, nest, um, et cetera. It's ones that are really using the habitats that we provide. Every year we, we get red-breasted nuthatches, black-capped chickadees, northern flickers, um, nesting in our, in our backyard. Um, sometimes, um, you know, other birds as well. Those are kind of the reliable ones. Um, and again, you know, we're right in the middle of Missoula on, at 8th Street. Um, and, and to give you an example, when we lived on 12th Street, you know, four blocks over, um, in a house we rented, um, we weren't, you know, just using feeders. They, we were renting a house, we couldn't do any landscaping, um, but just using like feeders and water, the only birds we were able to track were mainly house sparrows or house, you know, or house finches, which are uh, somewhat native. Um, um, and, and pigeons, frankly. <laughs> so it's not like we've changed, you know, very far, you know, in where we are, um, but we've landscaped it differently and seen tremendous, tremendous success from that. Um, I don't, we don't use conventional bird feeders. Um, the bird feeders are our plants. Um, bird feeders are, um, you know, are, are those standing snags and, and things like that. Um, you know, in, in, in most of most places in you know the west half of the state, you know it's it's bear country, and uh, you know you really can't have um, you shouldn't have uh, bird feeders out. They create predator traps. Like my, I, I um, I'm a huge fan of uh, of house cats, and I keep them in my house because I'm also a fan of birds. Um, my neighbors, I don't even know who. You know they have how they have cats that. Uh, that roam our yard, and um, and by having a bird feeder, you create a trap for those for those birds, for those uh, and for cats or other things as well. As we're seeing with not just um, you know we're seeing this a lot recently with with disease spreading, um, and this is a constant constant issue. Uh, they can lead to weeds. A lot of the a lot of the seeds um, that are in those um, you know generic feeds um, can uh, go unchecked. But really, is it uh, is it effective? And I don't think it's you know it's that effective. We have over seventy species of birds that have used our garden, but fewer than twenty percent of those actually use feeders or will will come to feeders because most of them, and for most times of the year, birds eat insects. Um, you know they eat you know berries or seeds when they're seasonally available, but it's the insects that really um, attracts them. Um, just to give you an idea, this is, uh, I, don't, I don't hope everyone can see, these are, this is like a, a picture of thatching ants, and it's actually a video of our front yard. Um, it is crazy, but this is one of the bird feeders we have, not in the heat of the day like it is right now. Let me zoom out here for you. Um, this is our front yard and our boulevard, but in the winter time, um, when, you know, the ants are deep inside the, you um, um, uh, in, in, inside this hill and they're protecting their larvae, that's when the flickers will excavate an area. If you can see this hole here, that's from a flicker excavating it to take the larvae out. And then it's the heat of the day um, and then the ants are, are rebuilding it. But that's a, that's a good bird feeder. Here you can see uh, where one a flicker has excavated it in the winter time to get those larvae. Um, or woodpeckers. Um, you know, excavating our, our aspen, for example. This is another example of a bird feeder. Here's another example um, with these aphids. You know, the, the aphid diversity in your yard can be really amazing. This is our, our like, uh, this is a, um, a big basin sage, and it, this is the most lush one we have in our yard that's being, that's being fed on by aphids and tended to by, by ants. And it's bird, birds like this, ruby crown kinglet, for example, that they eat insects. They glean those aphids off of those leaves. That's what they rely on. They're not going to come to a, a bird feeder. Um, and why it's so important about having these you know, native plants and insects that are attracted to them um, is because of, of this time of the year right now, like when, when species like black-capped chickadees, this is in our backyard, when they're feeding their young. Um, they hunt in a, in a really small geographic, or it's, it's hopefully a small geographic area, to return constantly to feed those young. Um, and they need a constant supply of insects. All of our, 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 our 
bird boxes have cameras in them, um, which is kind of fun to, to watch. And here's just a little video of what it looks like when a, um, when a chickadee uh, returns to, uh, to feed its young. And I apologize if it, uh, the video doesn't come, come over very well, but um, it's a very exciting moment when the mom comes back with a mouthful of, uh, of caterpillars to eat. But she's getting those caterpillars from native plants that the caterpillars are, are feeding on. So planning a native and gardening with, or, uh, and designing a native garden, there's some myths. Um, and this is where I don't want people to get discouraged. There's this myth, I think, that native plants take too long to get established or they're not appropriate for home gardens. And both of those can be true. Um, these are balsam root. You know, this is the staple of our, of our hillsides right now and the prairies. I mean, this is, uh, you know, people you know, love to see it. It's, it's springtime is here. Um, these may not really be appropriate for a home garden. They're very easy to grow, but the thing is you can't transplant them. So don't ever try to dig one up from the wild. It's not gonna work. Um, you can plant them from seed, but it takes about seven years to go from seed to a flowering plant. Um, so here's the thing. If you want balsam root in your yard, plant some seeds right now and then you know, design the rest of your life around those because <laughs> it's gonna take a while. And we started out with about three um, or four um, plants that we grew from seed. You know, it, you know, we seeded in our in our yard, and we had three or four. And now we have um, fifteen or twenty because we've had a couple of generations of them. Um, or you know, we have many species of lupin. It's the same thing. Um, it takes a long time for these to mature and flower for the first time, typically three to five years and maybe up to seven years, depending on the species. But most native plants aren't that way. Some other ones might not be appropriate for the, for the home garden. This is death camas. You know, uh, we have a lot of this growing in our front yard because we don't like our neighbor's kids. Oh, I'm kidding. Um, but, we, but, you know, I mean, th there, there are some really cool native plants that are great for attracting pollinators like poison ivy, um, or things, but it might not really be appropriate for the home garden. I don't know if death camas will really kill you, but, but I wouldn't uh, recommend um, eating it. Or bitterroots. Everybody loves the bitterroot, our state flower. Um, don't grow these in your garden unless you have a, a, you know, a place. They're, they're not really the gardener's friend, especially if you have a job during the day, um, because this is what, this is what bitterroots do. And maybe people aren't, don't tell you this. Maybe I'll get my Montana card revoked for making fun of bitterroots or something, but you know, for most of the year, there's nothing there where a bitterroot is. It's just a root that's growing in the ground or living in the ground. In November, it'll push its little needles up and you know under the snow. So you know, November to March, you're not even going to see its leaves. Then, then March, you'll see its leaves, um, and then by June, it will you know, or late May or June, it might flower. But they open up, like for me anyway. I'll go to work. The buds will be closed. Um, and then they open up during the day, come home from work, and they're closed. And then uh, after they're, you know, they've been pollinated, um, the the seed pods will blow away, and the leaves are gone until November again. Um, most people take too good of care of bitterroots. Um, they they water them or baby them, but they're actually a very tough, durable plant. They need open um, soil, um, so you know you can't grow a lot of things around it. Um, so th I think those are you know some examples of things that aren't um, necessarily appropriate, but there's there's so many other species apart from those. Um, be patient, or, or or frankly, you don't have to. So this was this is our yard in uh, in 2000, you know, 20 21 years ago, and, and I, you know we we hadn't lived here very long, and you know this was all lawn. Here's a lilac tree, and you know I think we thought at this point we were done. We planted this ponderosa pine, service berry, choke cherry, mountain hollyhock, and some other things. And I think we thought you know we're we're done with that. And then um, here's the happy couple. Um, we did we it led to more landscaping, and more, and and a greenhouse, which inevitably happens, and more until there's no more lawn um, and all native plants. Um, some of this, you know, happened very quickly, some slowly. And the point there is you can, you know, build over time. So work on a small area, have success and move on. But the plants can grow really quickly as many of these do. Um, just another, you know, a couple other ones. Um, this, 
this was our, our house you know, shortly after we, we moved in or after we, at least we made a garden here. Um, and then so it looks more like today. Oops, yeah, more like today. Um, yeah, balsam root, yeah, it takes, takes a while with them, but it's certainly possible. So some recommended, so this whole time I've been talking about diversity, 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 and inevitably people say like, well, what should I plant? So that's what I'm gonna kind of cover here. Again, I, I emphasize diversity, you know, but, um, but here are some plants that are easy to grow, easy to find, deer resistant, um, and, and offer some diversity and, um, and again, are very easy to grow, which I like personally. Um, but uh, white yarrow, so this is different than the, the, you know, the lawn weed, but it's our native yarrow. Um, I'll show you pictures of all these in a minute, but um, horse mint, otherwise known as um, monarda or um, a bee balm, um, hairy golden aster, hairy false golden aster, which is a, a low growing yellow flowered plant, uh, blanket flower. And all these, all these plants are, are, are native throughout just about all of Montana, um, but certainly in central you know, Montana. Um, we have a lot of different species of penstemon. Um, Wilcox penstemon is one of our more, more common ones, but there's many of them and they can be substituted for one another. Showy fleabane um, and goldenrod. So with just these you know, six or seven species, you have a big diversity in height of plants, flowering times. They're all deer resistant. It doesn't mean deer aren't gonna try them and there might be some deer that, that really does enjoy them. Um, but that's another question I get a lot of is what is, uh, you, know, um, you know, what is deer resistant? So here's white yarrow. Um, bee balm or horse mint or, um, yeah. Oh, and actually, well, actually, yeah. And there's also um, blanket flower, which I mentioned. Uh, and here's showy fleabane um, as well, you can see, and goldenrod, you can see all these together. Um, this is a whole sea, this is a deceptive photo. This is only about you know, three, four inches tall, but this is hairy false golden aster, um, you know, blanket flower again, um, showy fleabane. And grasses, I mean, grasses are really, really important. Um, you know, our state grass, blue bunch wheatgrass, prairie june grass, Idaho fescue, or rough fescue, very easy to grow. Um, and all of them are. And uh, um, if, you, if, if you're interested in, in some grasses. We don't have a lot of trees here, but we have a lot of sh shrubby shrubs and shrubby trees. Um, but, there's, there's, but these are really what provide a lot of structure. Um, and uh, in some examples, you know, depending on the habitat um, you're looking for, but rubber rabbit brush, uh, woods rose, golden currant, mock orange, three lobe sumac. These are all plants that are again, um, native throughout a lot of Montana, um, pretty drought tolerant um, or, you know, really for dry land areas and, um, and offer diversity. I'll show some pick well yeah so woods rose um, very common there's we actually have several species of roses ranging from the teeny prairie rose to the giant fruited you know nutka rose um, you know golden current is 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 one plant that often gets overlooked it's one of our first shrubs to flower wax current probably flowers or does flower earlier this flowers um, when it's coincidental with hummingbirds arriving to Montana. And this is a, such an important hummingbird food. Um, they, you know, hummingbirds migrate and they, they travel to follow those changes and blooms of our native plants across their whole migration. That's what they're tracking and that's how they time it. When they return in Montana, people think of like, you know, the classic hummingbird flower is a red tubular flower. Um, those don't really occur <laughs> in Montana, or if they do, it's, it's late in the summer, right? Um, you know, there's like scarlet gilia and, and some other ones, but um, we don't have a lot of red flowers here. But this yellow tubular flower is a big attractant. And because it's one of the first things to flower, it's one of the first things to fruit. And that's really um, enjoyed by a lot of bird species as well. That's why the timing is so important and our native plants are so important 
because they flower and they have a relationship with a uh, with you know they flower fruit um, or support insects that's important for those um, for for other animals. Some shrubby trees, serviceberry, choke cherry, mountain ash, you know, more in the um, you know mountainous part of the state, elderberry um, and hawthorn. You know, all of these um, are berry producing, you know, beautiful trees um, or shrubby trees that can be, you know, used in a variety of garden settings and they can be pruned, pruned from like a multi-limbed tree to a single limb or multi-trunked or stemmed tree as they would normally grow into, you know, something you know, more ornamental if you, if you wish. So how and where to get plants? Well, I think you know most of you all um, know very well the Native Plant Society is, you, if you're not a member already, you should certainly become one and get involved with the local chapter um, and find out um, you know, about uh, opportunities for, um, for plant sales or other things. Local nurseries is, is I think one of the best places. And I think it's so important to tell people that, you know, to ask the nurseries, where their native plant section is, or um, if they sell native plants, and um, to show that there is interest. Uh, salvages, you know, um, in the early 2000s, Missoula went through or stopped, or it was going through rather this outward development, and then now it's been infill. But during that time, um, unfortunately, a lot of beautiful grasslands were getting torn up for development. And um, and Marilyn, my wife, organized uh, plant salvages. Where, you know, people, you know, she contacted developers and, um, you know, found out where they were going to be digging, and um, all sorts of plant enthusiasts showed up first and removed all these plants from people's yards before they put a, a sod lawn down or excavated a basement. Seeds are a great source, um, a great way. You know, you're collecting seeds from the wild, um, you know, is a, is a fine thing to do. And there's some seed companies in Montana that, that sell seeds. Um, we can talk more about that if people have questions about that. But um, for, and transplanting, and you know, don't take plants from the wild. Um, but your own yard can become a, a, a fantastic source of native plants. Um, you know, we haven't purchased any plants in a long time. Um, you know, a few here and there just to kind of improve diversity. But most of our plants, I mean, a you know, vast majority of our plants have just come from other places in our garden. And we, we get so many, um, you know, native plants growing in our vegetable garden and things like that, that every year, um, except for this one, we have a, a plant sale. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that we donate to charity, but it's a uh, um, donate money to charity for that. But your, your yard um, can be a big source of, of plants. Some books and other references, if you're interested in gardening with native plants, there's a lot of them um, out there. Uh, a couple of my favorites are The New American Landscape, The Landscape Revolution, um, you know, Bringing Nature Home by David um, Douglas Tolmey is, is, a, is, a, is a classic and what most people think of when they think of, uh, you know, um, uh, gardening for wildlife. But there's a lot of books out there as well. And you can find all the information I just talked about, you know, anytime on, on, on that blog that I have um, or, or had maintained, um, including you know, the other plant recommendations or even those books, I think, are on there. So you're welcome to visit my garden at any point, um, you know, that way. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to um, take any questions. It looks like um, there might be stuff in the... Uh, in the chat here. Yeah, I can I can read them, Dave. Um, thank you so much. That was wonderful. That was just a great talk. Oh, thank um, you very much. Yeah. So I'm gonna now I'm gonna go back and and start a bit. Um, so there was a comment that um, someone in Billings had um, removed their lawn and replaced it with a Veronica ground cover and some perennial bulbs perennials and bulbs, and they actually found it really difficult that they couldn't keep on top of the weeds. Um, so do you have any comments of, do you get invasive weeds? Um, do you spend yeah. a lot of time weeding? Great question. Um, um, so in, in general, we, we don't get a lot of weeds. Um, and, and a big part of the reason is our yard is really dry. I mean, we, we only, 
we don't irrigate it. Um, you know, it doesn't need it. Um, and, uh, and, and, there, and, it, and it can be kind of harsh. I mean, I think if we were to water more, we would get a lot more weeds. In the springtime, you know, we get dandelions from the, the neighbors and, and things like that. Um, but most of the weeding we do is really, um, you know, we don't have, we, we don't have any lawn anymore, but um, um, so we don't have, a, you know, I mean, lawn is, is really tough to remove. You know, um, and if you if you go to my blog and look at the steps for doing that, the best way to do it is just to physically remove it using a sod cutter. Um, but it is something that that takes a long time. And we do have like you know there are some weeds we have that are really persistent. Like we have um, you know bindweed in our in our vegetable garden, and then it comes up like in the in a crack in the center of our garage. You know, um, the crack through the floor. Um, but it's it's amazing how few weeds we have, and I think it's because. Um, one, we don't water, but two, the site preparation. And that's, you know, really the most important thing. It's just like painting a house. It's the part that, you know, it's all the prep work um, that is not a lot of fun, but it, but it's really important. I mean, it really pays dividends in the long term. So for site preparation, physically, you know, removing the lawn um, and waiting to control what, what uh, weeds um, germinate there before doing anything else. Um, planting and applying heavy mulch um, to, to keep weeds at bay for the first and also retain soil moisture um, while plants get established. Um, those are some, some things, but yeah, it can be challenging. I mean, um, we don't spend a lot of time weeding. Um, the uh, majority of the weeds we have are just, um, you know, weed is just an unwanted plant. So the majority of the time, I'm just moving native plants that are in like the cracks of my sidewalks or our vegetable garden um, and potting them up and giving them to, to other people. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and I will vouch too that site preparation makes a big difference that you have to really get rid of, I don't know, in my experience, I had to get rid of um, a lot of weeds and make sure that I got rid of them before I brought in the plants I wanted. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. And, and it is, I mean, we do get, you know, I mean, I'm, don't, don't get me wrong, there are weeds, but it doesn't, we, we only spend a few hours a year really weeding and that's over, you know, it's over the course of the year. And then most of that's, I think is, 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 is like fun investigating what's going on in the garden kind of time. Yeah. So some people are wondering where you got your plants from. Did you develop them? I mean, you, you touched on seed collecting. And so is that how you got most of them? And yeah, we got them? a lot of them um, through, through seeds or um, some, you know, some from cuttings, you know, from the wild. Um, and again, you know, it's, um, yeah, don't, don't dig up plants from the wild. Um, we've purchased, you know, all, all the things I, I mentioned, purchased some from local nurseries, purchased some from the Native Plant Society, Native Plant Sales, um, all, all sorts of places, um, you know, we, we've acquired them over the years, yeah. And I see in the chat that then, Missoula, the Clark Fork chapter of the Native Plant Society is having their um, native plant sale on June 5th. Excellent. Yes, yes. Yeah. that is a fantastic source for native plants. Yeah, come to Missoula, come to the um, uh, the new farmers market and uh, and get your or the old farmers market. I'm not even sure where they're doing that anymore. I don't I don't know where I don't know where it is, <laughs> but um, get your native plants this year. I don't know what the the between COVID and other things. I don't know what's going on, but um, June fifth. Put it on your calendar. So uh, someone commented that their yarrow tends to take over their their garden. Yeah, that... and especially. Go ahead. It, it, I, sorry, I feel like I'm getting some on feedback. I don't know if anybody else is hearing that, but um, it can, um, and it could be a couple of different reasons. One, it might not be the native white yarrow, um, or if it gets water, um, it will do really well. You know. Um, a lot of these plants, you know, it's it's a fine line between like, you know, prospering or thriving and 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 taking over. You know, uh, like if you look in in this in this picture that I think is, uh, I guess I could, did I stop? Yeah, um, you can see that there's a ton of um, um, showy fleabane, and people might think, well, that's really aggressive, you know, um, but all plants can be moved, you know, or or things like that. Um, yeah, so there is. Uh, 
yeah, there is white yarrow in here. There's a lot of other species in here too. Just this time, you know, at this moment, you know, a lot of the showy flea vein or three vein flea vein actually is, is, is flowering. So I, you know, frankly, I like the plants that are easy to grow um, and, uh, and, and do really well, so. And so getting back to weed control, did you, um, you said you had knapweed in your yard. Did yes. you um, use an herbicide on it then or how did you get rid of it? I think we, I think we pulled it for the most part. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and that's the thing. I mean, there are some plants that you can, um, you know, that it's effective for, but it does take a while. There was a seed bank there. Um, and we have used herbicide on, especially on bindweed, um, because, you know, pulling doesn't do anything. Um, and, uh, 